sorry. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Recovery to Practice webinar entitled um, The Role of Spiritual and Faith Communities in Recovery. This is the first of our series of three webinars focused on the role of community and behavioral health recovery. My name is Lori Curtis and I am your host today. Um, and after some housekeeping and a short review of Recovery to Practice, we'll begin today's presentation. On behalf of SAMHSA, um, Substance Abuse of Mental Health Services Administration and the Recovery to Practice team, we'd like to welcome you all and to thank you for joining us today. We have over 125 individuals with us today um, in the audience and we expect that number to grow. Um, I would also like to thank our presenters today, David Meniz, Dennis Mendel, and Jim Zanizer, uh, for sharing their knowledge and their experience with us. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, a materials download box where you can download our presenters' bios as well as a PDF of today's presentation slides. To maximize the presentation area um, of this box, to, I'm sorry. To, um, this box will be removed once our presenters begin speaking, and that will make the PowerPoints larger for your viewing. The opportunity to download the slides will again be available at the end of the webinar. At the end of the session, you will also be able to download a certificate of attendance that you can use to apply for continuing education credits for your professional association. And now we have good news for you. This webinar has been pre-approved for continuing education hours through NADAC, the Addiction Professionals Association. To qualify for these continuing education hours, you must attend the full webinar and complete a brief quiz and a webinar evaluation. For more information, um, we'll be available to you at the end of today's webinar. At the completion of our webinar today, an opportunity to provide us with feedback will automatically appear on your screen. Please take a few moments to provide us with your feedback. Uh, we do value it and listen to it. Finally, if you've registered for the webinar, you will be emailed a link to view the archived recording, that recording that you heard earlier. This link will also be available to you on the Recovery to Practice website where you will also find links to past Recovery to Practice webinars, and we encourage you to take a look at those. This webinar series is hosted by SAMHSA's Recovery to Practice, and the overarching goal of this project is to improve the knowledge and ability of the behavioral health workforce to use recovery-oriented practices every day. But what do we mean by recovery-oriented practices? In 2011, SAMHSA released a working definition of recovery and a set of principles that incorporate aspects of recovery from both mental health and substance use conditions. SAMHSA's working definition of recovery is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness and live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. The 10 principles of recovery are shown on this slide along with the four major dimensions, home, health, purpose, and community, which form a solid foundation for developing recovery-oriented lives and for building recovery-oriented services and systems that are necessary to support them. SAMHSA's Recovery to Practice initiative helps you turn these principles into workforce practices. Recovery to Practice offers discipline-based curricula to promote the understanding and uptake of recovery principles and practices developed by these six professional disciplines for educating their own membership about recovery and behavioral health. These materials are available and adaptable for use by other disciplines and organizations seeking to build resources, um, seeking resources to build a recovery-oriented workforce. Links to these curricula are available on the Recovery to Practice website. Right now, Recovery to Practice is expanding its discipline focus to embrace multidisciplinary settings and integrated services. Those of us who work in behavioral health or integrated healthcare organization have opportunities every day to promote wellness and recovery. We can powerfully communicate hope for recovery and the value of self-care and wellness in just how we approach our work. Recovery to Practice can help you strengthen your recovery-oriented practice through free webinars, newsletters, training 
and technical assistance opportunities. This webinar will describe the important role that faith-based organizations and communities play in the process of welcoming and engaging people in recovery. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for today. We have three this afternoon. First is David Menuz, Meniz, um, who is a peer specialist for the Mental Health Center of Denver. He's been clean and sober for eight years, and one of the many recovery tools he used was his faith community and connections, drawing from many spiritual philosophies. David has a BS in health and wellness and a minor in human services and has worked to empower people with health and wellness goals. Previously, he developed curriculum and provided instruction for the U.S. Navy and has conducted workshops on topics such as nonviolent communication, conflict resolution, emotional response to terrorism, PTSD, and mind-body connections. <coughs> Excuse me. Dennis Mendel is the Director of Faith and Spiritual Wellness for the Mental Health Center of Denver. His background in education as a teacher, principal, pastoral ministry, and extensive research on the role of spirituality and mental health facilitate his passion for increasing mental health awareness in faith communities, assisting clinicians to develop strategies for incorporating spirituality into treatment plans, and encouraging peer awareness of the role that spirituality can play in their well-being. Jim Zanazer is a, tri, is a clinical psychologist and a Tri-West um, Group Principal and Senior Consultant whose work focuses on project evaluation, community assessment with a particular expertise in services for adults and youth with serious mental illness, consumer-driven services, and primary and behavioral health care integration as well as evidence-based practices. Dr. Zanazer is currently involved in a national training initiative through Pathways to Promise in which he is helping evaluate models of public-private interfaith partnerships for supporting people with mental illnesses. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, Dennis Mendel. Dennis. Okay. Well, thank you. Hello, I think I'm up on the camera, I hope so, and it's such a, a pleasure for me to be able to be with you today, um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, again, my name is, I'll just go by Denny, Denny Middle, I'm the Director of Faith and Spiritual Wellness uh, at the Mental Health Center of Denver, and just to help you get to know us briefly, it is the uh, Mental Health Center of Denver is a place for recovery resilience and well-being and has endeavored over the past 26 years to become really known locally and internationally uh, and nationally as a model of innovative and effective uh, community behavior health care. And for me, uh, the last five years has been a wonderful journey. I've so enjoyed it and just excited to share with you today some of the uh, things that are happening here around the area of faith, spirituality, and mental health recovery. Um, as we move forward here, I'd just like to introduce you to our mission, and that is enriching lives and minds by focusing on strengths and well-being. And this is our mission, and it's uh, founded on our philosophy that people can and do recover from mental illness, and that treatment works. And in a few minutes, I'm going to be introducing you to uh, an example of this uh, person who is very special and will share with you about this concept of focusing on strengths and well-being and recovery. So we look forward to that in just a few moments. Um, one of the uh, aspects that uh, I think has made the Mental Health Center of Denver so, um, uh, so special in its, in its recognition of where people are, and especially in light of what we're talking about today, that and that where people are in their area of faith or spirituality, the spark that's in them that keeps them going. And so people enter our treatment programs with many different approaches to faith and to spirituality. We also recognize that they come in with different levels of spiritual awareness and openness. And, and therefore, because of with that, um, awareness and that sense of what we're 
uh, about here at the Mental Health Center of Denver. We're very curious to see maybe if your organization in, includes any faith or spirituality in any of the following ways. I know ours is rather unique, but uh, to find out if you would please just go through this very quick, we'll take about 30 seconds, and I see some people answering already as far as um, do you assess the process, is there treatment, uh, uh, service plans that incorporate spirituality, how about the referral process, maybe to clergy, to faith-based organizations, um, how does spirituality and faith enter into the, the cultural competency of therapy, maybe you could respond to that. Or maybe it all, um, you, you just say, that's not an area that we go to right now, and uh, so we'd be very interested in, and appreciate your response on that. So again, thank you. It's interesting. We see some assessment obviously is in process. Wonderful to know that some of it's incorporated in treatment plans um, and also interventions and support. So thank you for giving us a, a, a a bird's eye view of this and hopefully we can follow up through connections in the future. And I'll move forward now with just to say that um, what we do to support this aspect of, of recognition that someone's faith or spirituality is important, the Mental Health Center of Denver does recognize that the sensitive, active, now that's an active support of spiritual life can enhance well-being and recovery. Well, how do we do this? How do we support this? So briefly, just let me say we have a number of approaches. And first of all, the Director of Faith and Spiritual Wellness is one. A position instituted five years ago, uh, which was came out of a concept that developed really almost eight or nine years ago. Jim Zanheiser, uh, who will be speaking to us uh, uh, in just a few moments was one who had that initial concept with one of our VP, VPs, Roy Starks. I've been the recipient of their vision and I'm so thankful for that. But the Director of Faith and Spiritual Wellness is a position that's designed to assist those we serve in the faith or spirituality area, our clinicians, how do they assess this, and our community. And we do this again in some different ways, if I could share with you briefly. So our approach is to create awareness. First of all, the awareness of the role of faith and spirituality in recovery and well-being. That is, we, if we can cr create that general awareness, it will help us move forward. Secondly is the, our approach to training. We endeavor to, to train our staff to assess the level of the importance of an individual's spirituality. And then after that assessment is there, should that be important? Should that be an area where they would like to proceed? Can we incorporate that into an outcome-based treatment plan? The next thing is literacy is so important, and especially as we get out to train and promote mental health literacy in our faith communities, can we build a bridge from behavioral health agency to the faith community? We desire to do that and promote literacy in that area and then to also facilitate dialogue between mental health and faith communities. So important. Can we build those bridges? Can we identify boundaries? And then uh, finally, it really comes down to just being supportive, to provide opportunities for the clinical, for the consumer, the peer, and faith community support. And again, as I mentioned, we try to determine boundaries, we then try to build bridges, and the model that we follow is called the COPE model. Now, we can't go through this uh, in, in, other than just to incite your interest, hopefully, to this, and saying that it is a model of developing uh, bridges and boundaries, and for your information, the developer of that is Dr. Glenn Milstein. Here's his information. I hope you come back. I've talked to him. He's more than willing to talk to any of you about this important model. Thank you. And now I'd like to just have the opportunity in keeping with our principles to practice, so to speak, today is put that into and introduce you to um, one of our uh, peer support individuals, David Muniz. And uh, David, thanks for being here. Well, and it's so good you. to get Hello. to know you and um, share with us a little bit about what, or maybe you could just share with us the goal or the mission statement of the peer support here at Mental Health Center of Denver. Right. Uh, our team uh, came up with this 
mission, and it uh, basically says that peer support inspires recovery, independence, and well-being by uh, helping others realize the potential that is within them. And uh, so we see we have different individuals like Gwen here, and this is personified in her. She's saying, uh, this is the best job I could ever have. I get to help people and tend to their needs. And there you go, uh, fulfillment and total well-being. You bet. And Dave, I've seen this in you too, so thank you. Hey, you know, um, as we've got to know each other a little bit, tell us a little bit about um, your story, your journey, your recovery journey. Would you share a little bit with the folks sure. on that? Sure. Well, when I was born, uh, my father was in prison, and my mother was 23 years old with six children. I had three siblings from my father, and my other two siblings were from my stepfather, okay. and uh, I was a middle, invisible child. Uh, later on when I went to school, uh, because I was different, I was in many fights, and um, Due to my emotional outburst in class, I was often placed in the hall or sent to the principal's office. Later on, I became a teenager, and because I had so much pain within my heart, mm -hmm. I uh, self-medicated using sex and uh, alcohol. Okay. So I became a teenage alcoholic. And so then, way early on, you started to self-medicate, okay. right? And uh, later on, I, I got married when I was 20 years old, and. Uh, my wife and I, we got involved because I was still looking for a father figure. We got involved in a religious cult, and uh, we disappeared. Our family and mm -hmm. friends didn't know where we were for over uh, over a year. After that, I joined the military and uh, entered my second marriage. And uh, because I was an alcoholic and I had uh, many issues, um, that ma marriage failed, yeah. and uh, I had another relationship with crack cocaine and alcohol. After that, uh, my life just spiraled, continued to spiral down, and I lost my relationship with my children, my home, my job, and I hit rock bottom and found myself uh, in the hospital for because I attempted suicide, and I had to make a choice. Either I should get to, live, get to living or get to dying, and I chose life. Wow. That we're thankful for, Dave. And I just wonder, so in all of this time, you, these ups and downs and things that you've been, so obviously you knew you had a substance use issue. Mm -hmm. But did you um, ever have any other diagnosis or therapy then at this time or any help? I didn't have any uh, uh, therapy at this time, and I was undiagnosed. Okay. And so then you hit rock, bock, excuse me, rock bottom, but then you said you chose life. So what did life look like then? What was the change? Yeah. Well, one, I made a choice, and two, uh, I had to learn how to love myself. Everyone's always saying, love yourself. So I didn't know how to love myself, so what I did is I made a poster board. Okay. And I put things up there that I do to love me, and one was forgiveness, uh -huh. one was family time, one was dancing, doing yoga, things that were about me that made me feel good about myself. Another thing is I had to break false lies. I had many agreements that I believed that weren't true about myself, and I had to break those lies. Okay. So a lot of the things then that you put on here were really sort of well-being concepts. Well-being totally. concepts. So how about this? So did you just develop this on your own, or did you have some therapy and any diagnosis during this? Well, after I made up my mind to uh, choose life, uh, I was fortunate enough to get diagnosed, and I started seeing doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists. Okay. I got involved in different groups, AA and AA. I went, I got totally involved in everything, and of course, I had a diagnosis. Then. Okay. And your diet, you mind sharing your diagnosis? Sure. Uh, bipolar disorder. Okay. Bipolar and so you've been continuing substance abuse to right. diagnosis. So thankfully, you've come to where there's been no therapy, where you hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And now you've moved forward, and thankfully there was a diagnosis, there was some therapy, there were some mm -hmm. things that you got involved with, and, and here you are today. Right. And like we said, treatment works, right, right? through resiliency helps. and so forth. But, you know, um, keeping what we're talking about today, so all of these things that you went through, what kept you going? Was there a spark? What was your hope during this time? What, how did you manage to continue? Yes. Something kept you from, brought yeah. you up. 
Well, I have, I have no doubt that there is a higher power in my life. Uh, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. There were many times I was literally left for dead, and uh, one time in particular I found myself in the middle of winter on a bus bench, uh, passed out. Okay. Somehow I woke up. Uh, another thing is when I was a child and I'd go to church with my uh, mother, I often felt a prompting in my heart to want to cry. And uh, later on in life, I went to church with a one-time girlfriend of mine, and uh, I had an encounter with God, and I couldn't stop crying. Okay. Uh, there's a wounded child inside that needed to be held, and there I filled the comfort of a mother and a father. And uh, so I know, and I've known, even in my darkest hours, that there was a God. So, uh, so in other words, if I could rephrase this and, and to help me understand this, and so even though you weren't practicing any in, at that time any religion or so forth, but in the darkest hours you came back to there was something inside mm -hmm. that you knew was was holding you up, and, right. and you, maybe you didn't even know, but something brought you to tears and so forth, and that right. and that's wonderful. So, um, well, how about just like you you progressed with your therapy. And now you sounds like you definitely are progressing with your faith, your spirituality. Mm -hmm. So, did you get connected to any faith organization, faith community, things yeah. like that that you could share that was beneficial in your recovery? Sure. Uh, at the time, I used to attend a church, and I received a lot of counseling there. And I was also practicing yoga, and okay. uh, that helped me get control over my body and find centering in my body. And I also attended a a Buddhist retreat, and I okay. learned how to quiet my mind through noble silence and other practices. So I did ah, have a lot of support. Good. So then you would you you found that then through going to um, well, let me ask you this. It sounds like the the faith community you went to, wherever you went, there was a receptivity to your diagnosis. Here right. you were. You you had used substances, you were diagnosed with a mental illness, and yet you were received well. Right. I was fortunate. I uh, There were no judgments, and the focus of my uh, therapy wasn't so much my addictions, but it was mm -hmm. just on me learning to forgive myself and to believe the truth about myself. Okay. Wonderful. So would you recommend that someone uh, in, in, in a case that might be dealing with situations to get involved with an accepting faith community or some other aspects like AA or the Buddhist community or so Right, and it's always a, according to how they want sure. to pursue their right. recovery. Wonderful. But yeah, if they do, I encourage it for sure. Okay. Um, Dave, as we move along, we have a few more minutes and I want to get to a couple examples. But just quickly, um, you know, a lot of the peer support individuals that you work with, when we had talked to them, they said, you know, their faith or spirituality was important, mm -hmm. but yet they wouldn't bring it up to their therapist. Right. So when you are dealing with uh, the mentees you're working with, and let's say that they have a faith or spiritual issue, do you encourage them to bring it up to their therapist? Is that important? Of course. If it's important to their recovery and they're doing groups or they're talking to someone, it's yes, I definitely encourage them. Bring it up. Uh, good. And then, and then um, the, the other aspect of that is uh, how about if you get, in, get involved with something that he says, boy, I'm supportive here, but, but this is probably beyond the boundary mm -hmm. that I should have as a supporter, and it, it either needs to go to clinical or it could go to faith right. community and build a bridge. How do you build the bridge? Well, I build the bridge. Um, in my past experience, I, I was lucky enough to build a bridge between uh, the two houses of schools of thoughts. By uh, I was in school, and I understood the clinical side of, of recovery, but also being in the faith community, and I was able to bridge them together. Okay. Uh, I believe, how, I believe, how, I how about how about now if for you? All right, we got a little feedback, but that's okay. Let's just keep going. How about though that worked for you? But what about when you're you're a person that you might be men, a mentee that says, "I don't know. Is there a way that you can get incorporate them, or that you do and help them get incorporated?" Yeah, I well uh, again, uh, I listen to what 
the individual is saying. Uh, I, I do active listening. And then I use a tool uh, like the HOPE uh, Spirituality Assessment Tool. And okay, so I can, that's, that's the one we shared with the uh, peer support people. Right. And by the way, folks, um, the HOPE Spirituality Assessment Tool and a number of others will be uh, available for download later on if you're interested uh, after the, the, the webinar. Thanks, Dave. Sorry to interrupt you. So if you, if you're, what you're doing, you're using that tool, and then and then give us some examples, maybe of, of well, some individuals you've worked with. And sure, how their tools work. Yeah, and so with that with that tool, I ask them what inspires you, okay. uh, what gives you comfort, uh, what helps you, and uh, depending on what they say, I listen. Like for example, I have a person that's a Native American, and they talk about that their belief is along the lines of Native American okay. belief. And uh, we will talk and we'll say, like the Hopi say, uh, we are the ones we have been waiting for, and that gives a sense of All empowerment. Right. I have other individuals that say, I don't even believe in God. I find okay. inspiration when I go running or when I uh, go out to the mountains or do my art. So we encourage, I encourage them in that. And I say, uh, you know, in your art community, okay. where do you do art, who do you run with, and to build and connect with that community. Fortunately, I'm not an expert in the clinical side or the spiritual side, um, they're peer yes. specialists, I yeah. hear, I'm here to support them, but uh, so I encourage them to go where they find support. Oh, okay. So whether it could be Native American, it could be somebody that has a biblical faith, or whether, you know, someone that has finds their spirituality through nature and so forth. So you, through the whole questionnaires and so forth, then you're, you're really sort of making a, a gentle assessment of mm -hmm. where someone is at, finding where they're at, and then if you can encourage them to connect in that way. That's right. Because that's what happened to you, right? Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. practicing it, yeah. so it works. So in the, the last few seconds that we have, David, how about what would you summarize at you as being a person in recovery um, and now and in turn helping others? For those that are listening today, what might you say? Hey, I'd like to leave you with this thought. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to supporting uh, recovery, independence, and well-being, it's important for us to continue conversations yeah. like this so that we can bridge the gap and uh, help enhance recovery for our people. All right. Hey, thank you. I very much. So appreciate it. And thank you so much, folks, for just allowing us to be part of this. And now we have the distinct pleasure to uh, introduce to you Dr. Jim Zanheiser and he will take it from here. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Denny and David. That was very inspiring, and I appreciate uh, what you have shared. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today and to share with you the Pathways to Promise model of community-based uh, support for recovery. Um, I want to just briefly give you an overview of my part of the presentation. First, I'll talk a little bit about who is Pathways to Promise, this uh, national non-for-profit. What is it all about? And then we'll talk, we'll get into the Pathways to Promise uh, model of mental health uh, community-based support, uh, talking about the structure of a mental health training collaborative, congregation-based mental health teams, and then a specific approach to providing community-based support in congregation and community settings called companionship that was developed by a mental health chaplain from Seattle named Craig Rennebone, who is a recent executive director of Pathways to Promise but has recently retired. Um, in my own congregation, about 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago now, during one uh, service, uh, during a time called Prayers of the People, a young man prayed out loud, God, help me not to kill myself today. And I think in, in a fundamental sense, pathways exist to help congregations learn how to respond well to embrace a person like this young man. I um, would like to uh, ask you a question take a poll at this point, and ask, uh, are you aware of congregations or faith communities that are involved in providing recovery support in the community? We have three simple choices here uh, for you to respond to. 
And uh, thank you. You're responding quickly. And we can see that so far most of you, yes, have seen that in the community, uh, maybe have not been involved in that type of activity yourself. But uh, you, you've been seeing that. And some of you have not seen such approaches. Um, actually, I don't think they're terribly common to see um, intentional efforts on the part of faith communities or congregations in the area of providing uh, support for recovery. Uh, so a little bit more about <clears throat> who is Pathways to Promise and why does Pathways have the tag putting faith in recovery. Well, Pathways has been a national nonprofit for uh, nearly 30 years now. I think next year or 2018, it'll be coming up on its 30th anniversary. And it was founded by people who had experienced mental illness themselves or in their family, but found that their faith communities or their congregations didn't really know what to do. Uh, in some cases, they might have been stigmatized and even shunned. But in many cases, uh, congregations were really unaware about how to help people who were facing uh, mental illness, mental health crises, and the like. And so a group of people came together and decided to uh, found an organization that would consist of national faith groups with representatives who would uh, essentially constitute Pathways to Promise. And it's interfaith. Uh, faith groups have included Protestant organizations, Catholic, Jewish. Um, the current board chair is from the Unitarian uh, faith group. We've had speakers at conferences from Hindu traditions, Muslim traditions, and so forth. So it is uh, truly an interfaith entity that attempts to provide education, that attempts to, to train congregations in the provision of support. If you look at this slide, the bottom part in sort of a yellow gold color, you can see that there's a depicted there a sort of progression from being unaware of mental health issues and perhaps even stigmatizing of individuals and families towards a greater tolerance of having them in one's midst, of helping them on the way to recovery, and progressing from there towards identifying that people have gifts and a challenge to offer the community and creating opportunities for them for recovery. Finally, there's what you might call full inclusion, where there's a recognition that congregations have something to learn from people who've experienced mental health issues firsthand. Pathways has a training curriculum and set of, of, of sort of structures and guidelines to help congregations move along this continuum of providing support uh, and full inclusion, starting with education, uh, with Mental Health 101. It's a brief sort of introductory training for congregations. Moving towards uh, training congregations in companionship and the development of congregation-based mental health teams. And then finally, towards helping congregations develop opportunities for people to share their stories their testimonies, if you will, of their lived experience of mental illness and recovery. Um, one of the structures that uh, Pathways to Promise has attempted to facilitate in many communities around the country, um, and this was sort of the brainchild of Craig Nunnebaum, whose name I mentioned earlier, former executive director of Pathways, is the Mental Health Training Collaborative. And we have collaboratives now in St. Louis, Denver, Los Angeles, Seattle, the Chicago area, northern New Jersey, one or two in some rural areas that are developing. And basically, these are groups of people who come together out of a common concern for educating and equipping faith communities and congregations and providing community support. Often, these structures have members who are consumers, peers, family members, and advocates providers from the mental health community who have a passion for this, of course, faith community members who have a, a vision and passion for creating opportunities for recovery in the community and being a part of that process, uh, and various other people who you might call champions for providing community-based support. Often these uh, collaboratives have what we call cluster facilitators 
people who are either volunteers or receive small amounts of pay to take uh, a part of the metropolitan area or the geographic area of interest and sort of work with congregations in those areas to help them identify their needs for training and education, their interests in providing community support. They work with them to arrange training calendars uh, for people uh, so that there is a common calendar that people use and, and to develop training and education plans. Then, of course, there are the congregations uh, who can be from any faith tradition. And they don't always have to be congregations, but so far, in other words, people can be from any entity that's interested in this sort of thing, but um, often they're representing a congregation. Uh, Pathways also has uh, a a curriculum that we call the Companionship Series. There's a, a three booklets that constitute the series. There are downloadable uh, PowerPoint presentations with notes from the pa uh, Pathways to Promise website, which was on one of the previous slides and can be made available. And this includes, as we were talking about before, Mental Health 101, uh, also a booklet and training on the development of congregation-based mental health teams and then finally on the provision of companionship in the community to support recovery and wellness. Um, a local congregation-based mental health team often consists of five or more people who are, have a particular passion for mental health-related ministry. I want to talk a little bit about these next. The teams provide a framework for mental health ministry for the congregation. They communicate in various ways to the congregation the importance of providing community-based support, the extent of the need in the community oftentimes. Uh, individuals on the team can serve as a contact to people who are experiencing mental health issues and their families, helping them get connected to formal support and informal support. Some of the informal support could include a participated participation in a companionship program, for example. Um, and they basically provide leadership to the congregation in becoming a more caring place to provide support. Um, in a sort of a typical uh, scenario, and, and the typical scenario is not necessarily always uh, implemented in a congregation, because every congregation is different. Every congregation is going to have uh, their own people who have particular areas of interest and expertise and experience. But in a kind of a one heuristic that we've found useful in training congregations is uh, to think about five, quote, mental health guides making up a team. One, perhaps, with interest in children and youth and mental health issues there. Another, with interest in trauma-related issues. Another, uh, who has concern for and interest in serious mental illness and related issues. Another with concern for alcohol drug issues. And finally, another guide with interest in seniors and older adults. Um, it's helpful for a congregation that is trying to communicate, uh, for a mental health team that's trying to communicate to the congregation what it's doing and who it is, to introduce itself on bulletin boards and announcements in the congregation at special meetings. And this is just a hypothetical group here. Uh, from a, a Jewish congregation. And um, here folks can uh, introduce themselves saying, hey, my name is Ira Rudin. I'm interested in children's mental health issues. I'm here to be of support to you, answer questions you might have, help you to learn about resources and opportunities in the community to get help if you are experiencing issues. And uh, otherwise, just be of help to you. I'm here to talk. So often congregations will put this kind of information up with people's photographs on a bulletin board or something like that in their congregation. In my own congregation, uh, I'll just share my personal experience. I am sort of our go-to person on serious mental illness. I've had a lifelong interest or career-long interest in serious mental illness ever since I met um, one of my best friends, disclosed to me in graduate school that he had schizophrenia. And since then, I've just had a passion for being a part of efforts to increase opportunities for, for recovery in the community. And in my role on our mental health team in my congregation, I worked with our local community mental health center 
to establish a relationship with our congregation and to make arrangements for them to refer people to us who might want companionship. Typically, they would refer people who are experiencing some social isolation. And we're looking for some sort of opportunity uh, to connect with someone who would help them uh, in, get a foothold in the community. More recently, we started meeting with our local chapter of NAMI, going to their meetings, establishing a similar relationship with them. The person that I've most recently begun to provide companionship to uh, was referred by a family member at NAMI. Um, this is uh, a photograph of myself, uh, the older guy uh, with losing hair on the left, uh, with the first person I companioned. His name is David. And David, uh, who gave permission to share his photo, uh, was the young man who prayed that day in my congregation that uh, God would help him not to kill himself uh, that day. Afterwards, I went and met with him and offered to provide him with some support. That was about 10 years ago. And David now uh, is married. Uh, he has a full-time job. Um, He's a blogger, and he, uh, he writes blogs on mental health, recovery, sometimes on faith, the role of faith. And we have had quite an interesting journey together over the last 10 years. It's one of, been one of the most meaningful things I've done uh, as a person working out of a congregation to provide community-based support. Companionship care teams. So I want to talk a little bit now about companionship care teams in a congregation setting. And this is a group of several companions, and we'll talk about what companionship is in a minute, um, who typically provide companionship to one or more individuals, usually one or two individuals at any given time. Some of the companions on our team do provide uh, companionship to more than two individuals, but it's rare for us to provide uh, companionship to more than one or two people. This is volunteer work, obviously, or I mean, yeah, obviously, but typically. Um, and so that's kind of what we typically do. Uh, companions are accountable to the congregation, a mental health team, or perhaps some other ministry team in the congregation, a health-related team. Uh, in my own congregation, we as a companionship care team hold each other accountable, and one of our pastors is on our team. We meet regularly to support each other for uh, some meditation, sometimes prayer, uh, sharing with one another and discernment. We provide each other with ongoing and periodic mutual support in our work as companions. Uh, Craig Rennelbaum, who developed the companionship model, describes it as a process, which begins with, as you can see at the top there, there's sort of a visual depiction of a somewhat tenuous relationship. Uh, when David prayed in our congregation that one day, I didn't know him very well. We knew of each other, but we didn't know each other well. Well, after that day, we began to meet at a coffee shop and just begin to get to know each other. So we established a relationship. Over time, what typically happens is the person who's providing companionship, depicted on the right-hand side, third group of circles down, um, is connected to, is not as socially isolated. This isn't always the case, but often we find in companionship it is the case that people are seeking companionship because they're feeling a little bit marginal and sometimes socially isolated. Over time, what happens is we develop a, a relationship of trust and mutuality, and we look for opportunities to help people develop a larger circle of care that is a natural one that on which they can rely and get involved with, and so that over time, that specific companionship relationship may become less uh, significant. Today, David and I just consider ourselves friends. Um, people who have companion other than David often don't want enough to have a relationship with me when our companionship relationship is over. But in the case of David and I, we have a friendship and not really a companionship relationship any longer. OK, I want to talk about the five practices of companionship. And I'm going to try to go through these relatively quickly, given the time that's remaining. The first practice of companionship is hospitality. And here we're simply offering a person some safe space in which we can begin to talk, in which we can get to know each other. 
we orient ourselves toward the person in a way that promotes dignity and respect, that conveys that. We see the other person, of course, as a worthy and valuable human being. Often we find it useful to offer some sort of refreshment, like a cup of coffee or an ice cream cone or something like that, just to get things started. The second practice of companionship, and these are practices because even though they sound very simple, and in some respects they are, and everyone can do them, um, they're practices. They take time to really develop uh, in the practice of companionship. So the second is neighboring. And here you can read the slide, and we again have this orientation of, hey, we're fellow human beings. I'm coming to you as a fellow human being, and I'm not going to come to you with my title as Dr. Jim Zonizer, a psychologist who has this and that role. Rather, I'm going to say to you, I'm Jim. How do you like to be called? We call this a frameless relationship. We're not coming at the person with our frame, the things that sort of define us in a role type way, but rather just as human beings. And that establishes the sort of a bedrock approach to the relationship. Kind of building on that, the third practice is learning how to share the journey side by side. In companionship, we're not providing treatment. We're not intervening, even. We're not trying to be some alternative to peer support and treatment in the community. Basically, we're just offering someone to walk the journey with you, if that's something you want. We're offering a listening ear. So we share the journey side by side. And we often find in the beginning of companionship especially that it's helpful to go on a walk together to literally walk side by side, to look out at the world together and to see what we see. The practice of listening, this is the fourth practice. And what I'm sharing with you now are sort of highlights of how we would do a training with people in companionship. We would go through these five practices, explain them in more detail, have various exercises. Um, and then over the course of the companionship care team meeting, we talk about these practices. But listening is basically the fourth practice, and it simply involves listening to the person, trying to get a sense of their story. We listen for the spiritual journey. Because of time, I'm going to move on to the final practice of compa uh, companionship, which is that of accompaniment. We're willing to go with people. What I've found is that can be a turning point sometimes is that willingness to go to the psych hospital with somebody and be there on the ward, the willingness to go to jail and visit somebody in jail. The practice of accompaniment is that going with part of companionship. OK, uh, I think there's a couple more slides, but I've run out of my time. And so what I'd like to do now is turn the presentation back over to Lori Curtis for our question and answer period. Lori? Can you, I hope you, Joe, uh, Jim, can you, uh, Denny, Dennis, you want to join me on screen? Okay, we're, all right. Wonderful, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation, both of you, um, all of you, actually. Um, I learned a great deal, and from both listening to you all, as well as from some of the, um, uh, active chat and so I'd like to there's some questions have come in and I would like to to share them with you uh, Jenny and, and and David your your dialogue raised um, a number of questions um, and some of them had to do with the whole role of kind of like a faith peer or the peer support that you're providing Dennis could you uh, clarify how that's the same or different than perhaps a sponsor or a recovery coach or other kinds of peer support? Well, uh, thank you, Laurie. If you don't mind, I'll defer that over to David because he is the one actively providing that position. Would that be okay? David, you guys are breaking up just a little bit, so. This better? Can you hear us now? Okay. So the, the way uh, we do it is, is as a peer uh, support person is I'm not really there to, uh, to uh, teach them or engage them with their, uh, their spiritual expression, but I listen to what they're saying. I hear the 
language, and I, I support them in whatever tool they use in their recovery. And uh, so I'm just walking alongside, I'm supporting them uh, with non-judgment, and uh, I don't have to know everything about their spirituality, but I do hear things uh, as far as like connectedness. I know about faith and, and how that plays a role in, in inspiring hope. So I, I support them in, in the understanding of recovery based on my experience and what I've learned. Does that answer the question? Sounds pretty good. Um, another question that's that's a little bit related to that is um, again to to you, David. Is uh, is this um is there any kind of of matching in these relationships? Are people matched by faith with with supporters or mentors? On and and if not, how do you work with people of different faiths? Well, uh, again, uh, we're not really matched with anyone according to their faith. But when we listen to their language and we off, we ask the question, uh, we hear what they say. And if, if you know, uh, we again, I don't have to know everything about Buddhism or or anything else. But I, I hear what they're saying. If they say I feel inspired and I I get my strength from this, then I listen and I encourage them in that. And if they want to share how they're being inspired, I listen. And so that's what we all do. We're not assigned to anyone in particular as far as their religious beliefs, but as peer supporters, we know how to support people in whatever tool they use. Right, and, and I'm going to open this up. I'm not sure if, Denny, you want to take this one um, or, or Jim, but there's been a, a, also a question about how does this apply to children and youth? who may be exploring their spirituality, um, especially if that spirituality of the child or young person is uh, different from that of their parents. It can be a bit of a sticky wicket for, for some people. So what, what are your thoughts on, on working with uh, youth? Jim, do you have anything in particular as far as pathways? Uh, uh, I Sure, I just have to, have to say pathways, is the area of children and youth is the one that we've more recently gotten into. Recently we had a grant working with a mental health training cooperative in St. Louis to develop a family notebook, we called it, of various kinds of uh, resources upon which families can draw. Um, there's a program at Georgetown, I'm blanking on the name, uh, a technical assistance center that we've used some materials from. But I think uh, the, it, the approach often is to provide companionship sort of relationship to family members and then help them kind of to support them and get connected to uh, treatment, other kinds of resources in the community. We haven't really trained people to provide direct uh, types of relationships with children more through their family their caregivers or parents. Okay, we've also got some questions I think that are pretty related to, to you, Jim, but I think there's a going asking for a great deal more detail on the process you use for building congregation, um, congregational body that you know, welcomes and engages people. We will be sharing um, Jim's and Denny and David's email address in the next slide. So I think all of them would very much welcome um, detailed questions and follow-up um, if we're not able to get to your specific question or if you want to deep dive into some of those um, community kind of areas. One of the questions that has come and I would like to address, I'd like to start with you um, perhaps, Jim, and that's the question of how do some of these initiatives get financed? It sounds like a great idea, um, but it takes coordination time. It takes some support. H how does this work on the street? How does that, how do you, how does this get paid for? Um, so when we say this, there are various things. So there's a mental health training collaborative. How have those developed? Um, we've gotten funding from state mental health authorities in some cases, and others from foundations by writing grants. Um, a really successful and large mental health collaborative in the Chicago area has gotten started just by volunteers. Over time, they've developed some funding relationships with foundations, and they've gotten some funding from Pathways to Promise, although <laughs> our funding is quite limited. Uh, there's a, a Los Angeles uh, collaborative that has obtained funding 
a champion who works within the county department has been able to get the county to support a clergy academy that's very interfaith oriented. Um, at the congregation level, it, it's, my experience has been that it's all been just volunteer work with champions who've just been interested as part of their involvement in their community uh, to volunteer, to come together uh, for no pay at all. Um, and so maybe the congregation might buy the Pathways booklet series <laughs> on the curriculum, and that's about it. So, um. Denny, do you want to talk a little bit about how that works at um, Mental Health Center of Denver? Um, sure. The, the, um, the step that the Mental Health Center of Denver made was uh, really one of, uh, I would say, quite significant in saying, as a secular agency, we are going to employ someone uh, as, a, as a regular non-funded uh, non position as far as for grants or, or anything else, uh, though what I do, uh, because I am not a licensed um, clinician, therefore uh, I cannot bill for services. I work with those who can, and, and, and so, but what they, they made the commitment to invest in the community through my position investing not just in the community to go out and build a collaborative support and awareness within faith communities. And therefore, yes, if we can build more aware awareness and bridge that, uh, build bridges with faith communities and then ultimately build bridges with faith communities and clinicians for the benefit of those in recovery, then just by increasing the awareness of those with um, of those within the faith community, we have, have gained, because we're nonprofit, we have thankfully gained support. For instance, we have a, a breakfast once a year. And, 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 and so guess who I send my invitations to, to that fundraising breakfast? I send it to my faith community connections. And so that's just an example of, of uh, we're looking for this position to hopefully be, uh, in one sense, in this broader perspective, being uh, reaping some benefits through community involvement. All right, uh, last question, and I'm going to direct this to you, Jim. How do you respond to individuals who are concerned, congregation members or congregations, who are concerned about risk and liability um, in terms of getting involved in this kind of, um, we'll call it a ministry? Yeah, that's a, that's a very, of course, important concern. Um, and basically the way we've handled it, um, and we haven't had any issues that have arisen so far, and maybe that's partly just luck, <laughs> but uh, the way we approach it is to say, this is not treatment. This is not a formal treatment intervention program. We, are, we convey to people right up front, I'm just here, I'm a member of this congregation. Part of our interest is in walking alongside people who are uh, trying to get more of a foothold in the community, trying to achieve goals in their lives. Um, and so what we offer is just a listening ear. Uh, we're not going to try to tell you what to do. We're not going to give you advice on how to deal with your situation. We're really just going to listen and walk alongside. Uh, and be, we, we call it a ministry of presence. And the belief is that a, a mere listening presence it can be powerful for people. So it doesn't mean that you know, a liability issue could never arise, but I think because that's the orientation that um, it helps to obviate those concerns and those likelihoods. Well, thank you so much, Jim and Denny and David. It's been a most informative and, and interesting presentation. I really thank, really thank you for your thoughtful comments, responses, and expertise that you share. Um, for further information, uh, those of you who are in the audience, uh, if you'd like to reach out to uh, Dennis, Dave, or um, Jim, here is their email address. And again, they welcome um, your follow-up, as well as the Recovery to Practice website and we or an email. We would love to hear from you as well. We were not able to get to all the comments and questions. We are excited about some of our upcoming Recovery to Practice webinars. Um, we have the second two in this series on community, including meaningful connections, engaging communities to re promote recovery next week at the same time and place. 
and recreating recovery-oriented person-centered plans with community resources in two weeks. Again, the same time and place. Please join us for as many of you can. If you cannot join us, remember all of these webinars are recorded and will be available on the Recovery to Practice website, um, along with available slides and associated materials. Please note that in the materials download pod on your screen right now, you will see the uh, spiritual concerns assessment um, uh, uh, assessment that Dennis and David um, referred to. And this will be here um, for a few minutes while we, we follow up. These uh, materials will also be on, on the website. The, the uh, presentation slides are also available along with the presenter bios. If you are interested in receiving NADAC CEUs, please click here, um, and you'll be directed to a page with the evaluation and a quiz to complete to get your certificate. If you're not interested in NADAC CEUs, um, you may um, get a particip certificate of participation as well as the slides. Um, so please complete the evaluation opportunity, feedback opportunity that will follow directly upon this slide. We value your input and find it extremely helpful. On behalf of SAMHSA, I would like to thank you all for taking time out of your day today to attend this webinar, and we appreciate your interest. This concludes our call, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you so much.